So um, we will get started now. Dave Talley, do you mind opening us up in a word of prayer real quick? Yeah, happy to. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. And we thank you for the message that Connor's about to bring. Uh, please be with us all, oh, Lord. Help us to learn what you want us to learn in your word. Thank you, Jesus, for your many blessings. In Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Connor, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for um, being with me tonight, guys, and letting me share with you for a few minutes uh, from God's word. I'm going to uh, share with you uh, uh, something I shared with our church a couple of weeks ago. We we're in the middle of a sermon series in Romans, and uh, uh, we've spent <clears throat> weeks now, I don't know, six weeks maybe, maybe eight, walking through Romans chapter eight. And uh, one of the most significant chapters in the entire Bible. And uh, Romans 8 is fascinating for a couple of reasons. Um, it seems to be kind of where uh, the book hinges. Um, the first seven chapters speak a lot in the uh, book of Romans about uh, God work, uh, God's work for the believer, you know, like uh, um, our justification that we have received by faith, um, the work of God, the, the uh uh, essential gospel uh, that he has afforded us. And, and then in chapter eight, it really speaks more towards uh, God's work, not necessarily for the believer, but in, uh, 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 in the believer. And so it's, it's really predicated on this idea of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is mentioned, interestingly enough, by name, only two times in the first seven chapters of Romans. But the Holy Spirit is mentioned by name 20 times in Romans chapter 8. And so it seems to be pretty significant that Paul now says, okay, in light of what God has done for you, let's talk to, uh, let's talk about what God does in you. And that's where he, he goes in chapter 8 and he talks about walking by the Spirit and putting to death the deeds of the flesh, right? And he's talking about the way in which we are now empowered, supernaturally empowered to live this Christian life. And the way in which we're supernaturally empowered to live as God has called us to is by the indwelling ministry of God's Holy Spirit. And so it shows up obviously in initially in chapter eight in that he's talking to the believer about how to live in light of the Spirit's uh, conviction and power uh, in your life. And so you, you no longer are submissive to sin. Now you can be obedient to the Spirit. But, but then he goes further, and this is where we're going to camp out tonight, and he begins to help the believer understand, okay, but life isn't always easy. The Christian life is not an easy life, and, and non-Christian or Christian alike, every person is going to experience difficulty and hardship. And I need you to see that the Spirit of God not only empowers the Christian for the life that God has entrusted to him or her, but the Spirit of God is going to be the means by which you can navigate suffering and hardship and difficulty, which inevitably every person is going to endure. And so, uh, that's the last half of Romans chapter eight is the ongoing ministry of the spirit, uh, as specifically as it relates to the suffering, uh, that people are going to endure. So we'll read tonight, just one verse really. Um, but I, I want to share with you what I believe are four biblical ideas drawn right out of the scripture here, uh, that might better help us navigate our seasons of suffering. In other words, how might we be best prepared to suffer well, uh, in, inevitably knowing that it's going to be a part of the life that God has entrusted for us to live? So this is Romans chapter 8. And again, we'll just read one uh, verse. And this is where in the chapter where Paul speaks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, now he pivots and he says, beyond just this Christian life, now let's talk about how the ongoing ministry of the Spirit uh, empowers you to suffer or to endure hardship uh, in a manner that is worthy of your faith. So this is verse 18, Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul says this, so for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing 
with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So again, I think I just want to share with you what I think are four biblical uh, realities about the subject of suffering. Again, if we're going to be men, obviously you guys uh, care about your relationship with the Lord or you wouldn't give your Monday night to a Bible study. And so if we want to be men who understand what the Bible brings to bear on the subject of suffering or anything else, then we need to study God's word to see specifically what it might entail so that we might be able to suffer in a manner worthy of our faith. So here's the first reality that I think Paul points out to us, and that is this, and this is going to be obvious, but it should be stated. Suffering is not singular. Okay? Suffering is not singular. And here's how we know that, okay? Look again at what the word is for suffering in, uh, in your Bibles in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings, now our English Bible has translated that into the plural correctly, because in the original Greek language, that's the Greek word panthema. It's actually a plural form of, uh, of the word suffering. It can also be translated as a tragedy, a pain, a hardship, or a difficulty to endure. Well, that sums up suffering. Suffering is painful. It's, it can be tragic. It can be difficult to endure, and it can often be described as a hardship. And the fascinating thing about the way in which Paul writes this to the church is it's not a one and done kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like naively, I wish that suffering was like, like chicken pox. Like you get it and then, right, and then you're over it. Like you check that box and now you get to move on. But it, it's not. Suffering is plural. It's not singular. It's, it's the under. That's why we speak about suffering in seasons. Like there's just some seasons when you suffer, some seasons that are difficult, some seasons that are hard. And you guys have heard this said a million times, but you're either in a season of suffering, you're headed into a season of suffering, or you're coming out of a season of suffering. But we all understand just the nature of the difficulty of life is that it's not a one and done kind of thing, right? Suffering is not singular. And it's important that we understand that. Otherwise, if we don't understand that suffering is not singular, then we're going to grow very discouraged when difficulty shows up for the second, third, fourth, and 56th time in our life. We'll end up growing very discouraged. And the Bible wants to be honest with us about the reality of life in a broken world. And that reality is that suffering is not singular. That's why, if you think about this, if you know your New Testament, you know that the half-brother of Jesus, when he wrote his epistle to the church, James, in the very second verse of his letter, after he introduces himself, James says, count it all joy, my, brother, my brothers, when you face trials in the plural. So he wrote to the church and he said, suffering is not singular. You're going to face not a trial, but trials. It's James chapter one, verse two. So there's this reality that we've got to be honest with ourselves and with others about life is broken. And in the brokenness, sometimes it's going to yield seasons of suffering. And here's what I would say. While nobody suffers the same all suffering is shared. So this should make us empathetic toward one another, that while we don't all have the same story, we all haven't suffered in the same way, there is a shared reality amongst every man on this call in that we've all had seasons of suffering. And Paul is honest with the church about that, and the Bible is honest with us about it as well. So suffering is not singular. This is a biblical reality that must be embraced by the church. Otherwise, we'll grow very discouraged when we end up facing difficulties in our lives. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's the second thing I would say. Not only is suffering not singular, but suffering should be stewarded. Stewarded. Here's why I would say that, okay? Paul says this, for I consider 
In the Greek language, the word there for consider can also be translated as measure or account. So Paul says that he is reckoning, he is measuring, he is accounting for his sufferings. That means he is thinking about what it is that he is having to endure. Suffering is not something that should simply be ignored, and it's not something that should um, uh, be forgotten. It should be considered. That's what Paul says. And in light of the consideration of our suffering, we must ask ourselves, for what is the purpose that God has entrusted it to us? Well, it's to steward. It is to steward. Suffering must be stewarded. And uh, I'll, I'll explain. I'll try to illustrate it like this. If you've ever seen, uh, if you've gone to the hardware store, I remember when I was a kid, my dad was not handy at all, but uh, he knew just enough to screw something up so that my mom would have to call an actual repairman. And uh, I can't tell you how many times we would go to the hardware store. It was a true value hardware store. And I always liked going because there was just racks of, of tools and just cool stuff hanging, you know, and it, as, a, as a little boy, I was always fascinated by that. And, and, uh, and I remember seeing in the hardware store a, a key machine, you know, one of the machines that would, uh, that would make a key. And uh, I've watched them do it a number of times. And what they do is they take a master key and they obviously lay it down into this machine and lock it into place. And then they take uh, a piece of metal that is very rough in its form. Uh, it, it hasn't actually been fashioned uh, to unlock anything. And, and they lay it down over the top of it. And then they pull the machine so that it grinds the um, 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 plain metal into the exact same shape as the, the key that is, you know, wanting to be uh, uh, replicated. And it's messy and it's loud, you know, it's noisy and there's uh, little filings that, you know, kind of go everywhere. And, and uh, it's, it's, so it's a whole process. Um, but I would say that's the same way suffering is. is uh, suffering is, is uh, it can be noisy, it can be messy, it can be awkward, it can be difficult. But in the end, because the master is laying over us something, he is shaping and carving and molding us to the place where he is preparing to use that key of suffering to unlock something in our lives. And I don't know what that suffering always is, but I know that when it's stewarded, like Paul says, when it's considered then God can use it to unlock certain things, whether that's a deeper appreciation for himself, whether that's a deeper understanding of his grace, whether that's a compassion for others that are navigating their own seasons of suffering. Like, you know, our testimony, my wife and I have five kids and we have two daughters with very severe medical complications. Well, God has used our suffering as the key to unlock the door to be compassionate toward parents that are navigating difficulties with their kids' health. And he just happens to have used the key of suffering to unlock that ministry for us. And so I would say not only is suffering not singular, but suffering should be stewarded. Paul says, I think about, I consider, I reckon, I, I measure, I give an account for the suffering uh, that God has entrusted to me. So I would say on this call, fellas, uh, it would be beneficial if you got in the margin of your Bible or in your journal and, and really tried to ask yourself, what is God teaching me? What is God unlocking through the difficulty that I have been entrusted to endure? What's he showing me? What am, what's, he, what's he using? What's he growing? What's he doing, right? So he's unlocking something. And when you choose to steward your suffering, um, then you get a glimpse into what it might be that God is, is up to with that. So, so that's the two things. So first, suffering is not singular. The second, suffering should be stewarded. The third is uh, suffering cannot be compared, and so suffering should not be compared. Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So pretty significant wording of the Apostle Paul. He said it's not worth comparing. Uh, 
me meaning it is unable to compare. It's insignificant in comparison to. And so we would want to think about it in a couple of ways. Suffering cannot be compared to what is awaiting us on the other side of eternity. It just cannot hold up. Whatever Paul would use when he writes to the church in Corinth, he would describe his suffering as a light momentary affliction. And uh, if it was anyone other than the Apostle Paul who was using that kind of language to describe it, I would immediately discount it. But this brother was beaten. Uh, he was three times flogged with 40 lashes minus one. He was shipwrecked a few times. He floated out at sea a night and a day. Uh, I mean, he was snake bit. He was imprisoned. I mean, this brother suffered, right? And so he's, he's, he's got the skins on the wall to be able to say. And when he says that I consider that the sufferings of this present time cannot be compared to the glory that is to be revealed, then we have to take him at his word. God's word says it cannot be compared. So then beyond that, I would say the challenge for us is that it should not be compared. If, it, if we know it cannot compare to what's coming, then it shouldn't be compared right now. And I'll just be honest with you and vulnerable and tell you, here's a couple of things that trip me up in my comparison of suffering because I'm guilty of it. So I can often compare my suffering to the suffering of others. And so I find myself jealous uh, because it seems like somebody has it easier or somebody doesn't have it as hard or uh, it doesn't cost them as much or isn't as right. And so we'll end up comparing our suffering to the suffering of someone else. And it should just be stated, even though you already know, there's no trophy for who has it worse. Like, like there's no, there, we're not going to get a plaque that says this guy had the hardest suffering. You know, it doesn't work like that. It's all relative. And what's hard for you is hard for you. And, and uh, what, what would validate suffering for you is what validates suffering for you. And that's why when the writer of Hebrews says, uh, uh, who uh, let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us, right? So that we wouldn't get in this lane or get in that lane, but we would stay in our own lane. And, uh, and so we need to guard ourselves against the temptation to want to compare our suffering to the suffering of someone else. And I know you guys don't uh, navigate this probably as much, but I would say younger generations that have grown up on social media, uh, they're constantly in a comparison game. And, and, and so that comparison game can be what I, what I have, but it can also be what I don't have. Uh, what they have versus what I have instead. And so it cannot be compared, so it should not be compared. And the first temptation is we can try to compare our sufferings to that of someone else. The second comparison is uh, trying to compare our suffering to a life without any. And what a futile exercise, because life is broken. And in the brokenness of our life, because of the introduction of our sin, it's impossible on this side of eternity to not have suffering. And so it becomes an unhelpful exercise that lends itself toward our being ill-equipped to handle suffering in a redemptive way when it shows up if we compare our difficulty to a life without any. It's like daydreaming for something that is impossible to actually enjoy. And so rather than simply pining away, wishing that it would just get better, we need to lean in. Remember, we're called to steward our suffering. So we need to lean in and try to figure out what are you teaching me? What are you trying to unlock through this key of suffering that you're wanting to reveal in me so that when it shows up, uh, I will be ready and, uh, and prepared to, to see it bring about a redemptive uh, conclusion. So that's the third reality is suffering cannot be compared. And, and so it should not be compared not to the suffering of others and not to a life without any. And then that leads me to the last thing. And I think the most hopeful, and that is this thought that suffering is for now, but it's glory that is forever. And, and again, I don't know where you are, guys, in, in your own walk and, and the things you're navigating in your life today, but it wouldn't matter if you had the greatest day of your earthly life today, uh, or it's the worst day of your earthly life today. 
This should be something that gets you excited every day. That suffering is for now, but glory is forever. And that's what Paul says. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. And Paul paints a picture of a day coming when God will make all things new, when he will reconcile every wrong and make it right, where he will wipe away every tear, where there'll be no more grief, there'll be no more death. Cancer will never be a diagnosis that gets uttered ever again. I think about it in terms, there'll be no need for wheelchairs. There'll be no need for seizure meds. There'll be no need for feeding tubes. There'll be no need for round the clock uh, care. There, that day is done. And, uh, and so for every day, fellas, between this day that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter that God preserved so that you and I might study it on a Monday night right now, for every day between this one and then that day, we cling to the truth that suffering is for now, but glory will be forever. And that's what we have to look forward to. And that is a promise that is made to the church. Remember, Paul's not writing uh, in a Hallmark store. This is not a billboard that gets posted on the side of the tollway in North Dallas. This is a promise for the church, that for those who are in Christ Jesus, you get to cling to a reality that while suffering is not singular, while it should be stewarded, while it cannot be compared, and so it shouldn't be compared, it is for now and glory will be forever. And this is a truth. This is a confident reality that the Apostle Paul means for the Christian to cling to today. And so that's why I, when I read passages like uh, uh, John's uh, vision of, of the end times and uh, Jesus culminating uh, with the new heavens and the new earth, I get excited because it gives me a confidence. And uh, in no matter what it is I'm having to endure on, on this day, that there will be a day when Jesus Christ reconciles all that has gone wrong. And so I thought I would just kind of close our conversation tonight. And then if you guys have comments and questions, we can talk through that a little bit more. But what I thought I would do is just read to you a little bit out of Revelation chapter 21, um, because this is a fascinating reality that Jesus Christ would show up to a man who had been condemned as crazy. And he showed up on an island where he had been exiled for his confident belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus would give him a vision uh, uh, that would be written down and preserved for us so that we might have a confident assurance of what was to come in the midst of what is really, really hard to endure right now. And so that's what John uh, uh, shares with us in Revelation chapter 21. And I'll just read a few verses and then I'll, uh, I'll pray and, uh, and I'll turn it back over uh, uh, to Dave. So. Here's what John writes. This was the vision he caught when Jesus showed up and told him a little bit about what was to come. He said, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It was prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they'll be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. And neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. Now, I press pause for a minute because I want to remind you of the definition of that Greek word panthema, right? It meant tragedy. It meant pain. It meant hardship or a difficult thing to endure. But on this day, this day, John tells us that Jesus says there'll be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write this down, John, for these words are trustworthy and true. And so, fellas, be encouraged tonight that suffering is a reality of life in a broken world. Not everybody suffers the same, but that suffering is certainly shared. And, uh, and even though it isn't 
singular and it should be stewarded. It can't be compared. It shouldn't be. Uh, it's only for now, but glory, Revelation 21, will be forever. And so uh, I pray that that's an encouragement to you guys on this Monday night and gives you something to cling to uh, for the balance of this week. Let me pray and then I'll turn it back over to you, Dave. Father, thanks for tonight. Thanks for the truth of your word. Thanks for uh, the preservation of the scriptures. Uh, I can't believe that you told John to write these things down and that we still have them in our hand even now. And so thank you on this Monday night, God, uh, that with the difficulties that we all have to face at different seasons and moments of our life, uh, that we can be confident knowing that Jesus Christ has overcome. And on this day, we can look forward to a day when you make all things new. And so thank you for never leaving us nor forsaking us, being near to us in every moment of our lives. And we pray all of this in your good name. Amen.